Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on finance, constitution and economy. As ever, I would be grateful for succinct questions and answers, particularly since I do have some indication of interest in supplementaries already. Question number one, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy last discussed funding for public services with Dundee City Council. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, the Scottish Government engages regularly with all local authorities in Scotland, including Dundee City Council, on a wide range of issues. Thank you. Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Dundee City Council has announced it is to, to make £28 million worth of cuts over the next two years. Coupled with the £27 million worth of cuts that NHS Tayside is to face, it means that we have a £55 million black hole in our finances. Given the relatively high deprivation, deep-rooted health inequalities and low employment in my city, does the Cabinet Secretary believe it is fair for his government to ask Dundee and Tayside to make such deep cuts? And what impact does it believe it will have on my community? John Sweeney. The first point I'd make to Jenny Mara is, of course, that the Scottish Government budget has, over the last five years, reduced in real terms by 10%. And uh, in that context, the Scottish Government has uh, worked assiduously to protect and to deliver public services. Indeed, for the health service, it has uh, resulted in a real terms increase in the budget of the health service. And of course, we have uh, guaranteed that that will remain for the uh, remainder of this parliament and for the next parliamentary term. And for local government, it has meant uh, a very fair financial settlement uh, in comparison to the significant reductions in public expenditure that have taken place for local authorities south of the border. Uh, the government will work cooperatively with all public authorities in Scotland as we work through the implications of the spending review on the 25th of November to ensure that we put in place a sustainable budget that meets the needs of the people of Scotland, including those of the city of Dundee. Many thanks. Question number two, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and the Economy is taking to help stimulate the housing market. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, our planned investment of more than £1.7 billion in affordable housing over five years has significantly benefited the many house builders across Scotland who win the contracts to build those homes. Innovative funding and delivery models using charitable bonds, pension finance and guarantees have complemented our traditional affordable housing programme, such that we are well on our way to achieving our target of 30,000 affordable homes to be built by March 2016. We have also supported sustainable home ownership with £305 million worth of investment over three years, going to help to buy Scotland shared equity scheme, including the £30 million help to buy uh, Scotland small development scheme. Since 2007, our popular low-cost initiative for first-time buyers, the Lift Scheme, have helped over 10,000 people on low to moderate incomes to get a foot on the property ladder. For 2015-16, we have allocated £70 million to our open market shared equity scheme. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very detailed uh, uh, answer? And could you confirm that the actions taken by the Scottish Government are helping thousands of Scots to purchase their own homes? And is he further able to confirm that the number of houses sold in Scotland has reached its highest level for more than seven years? John Sweeney. President Officer, it is some achievement to see the volume of transactions continue to increase. The latest data released on the 27th of October showed that there were 28,019 residential properties sold, an increase of 6.5% on a year ago. It is no doubt that our actions have assisted this. Since 2007, the Lift Shared Equity Scheme have helped over 10,000 people on low to moderate incomes to get a foot on the property ladder. Um, we uh, also uh, note that volumes uh, are still, however, well below pre-recession levels, and we will continue to work with the industry to maintain the upward trend that we are currently experiencing. Thank you. Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary uh, agree with the findings of the uh, Commission on Housing and Wellbeing that Scotland currently faces a housing supply crisis, that we are building fewer houses than we have done for 70 years, and does he also agree with the target they have set, provisional target, that we should build 23,000 homes a year in this country? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the, the first point I'd make is that, uh, um, and, and Mr McIntosh and I have, have gone over these issues many times in the last few years, 
When the government's capital budget is reduced by 25%, then that means that there are constraints on the capital expenditure that we would like to deploy. For that reason, we have then resorted to innovative funding and delivery models, which have helped us to achieve what I think many people thought was a, a very significant target to have set of uh, 30,000 affordable homes by next March. And as I said in my original answer to Mr Coffey, um, we, are, we are well on our way to achieving that target by that date. Um, there is, of course, further demand, uh, an unmet demand for housing within Scotland. That is precisely why the First Minister has set out that if this administration is returned in the elections next May, we will commit ourselves to a, a target of 50,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of the next Parliament um, as a significant contribution to addressing the demand that is clearly illustrated for housing within Scotland. Thank you. Question number three, Margaret McCullough. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting sustainable economic growth in town centres. Minister Fergus Ewing. <clears throat> Scotland's town centre first principle agreed with COSLA, together with the range of measures set out in the Town Centre Action Plan, set the conditions and underpin activity designed to tackle key issues <clears throat> such as empty shops, diversify town centre and thereby attract a range of businesses and services to locate there. We deliver the most competitive business tax environment in the UK with over two in five rateable properties in Scotland paying zero or reduced rates under the Scottish Government Small Business Bonus Scheme alone and further relief also available under our Fresh Start and New Start schemes. In addition to support local authorities who remain responsible for local economic development we have also introduced a substantial new power under the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 215. Uh, this gives councils more control over business rates and an opportunity to tailor them to their local area and circumstance. It could be applied in order to attract new investment to our town centres. Thank you. Margaret McCulloch. Uh, thank the Minister for his reply. In GVA Bar's sixth annual report on Scotland's town centres, they highlight some encouraging signs of growth, but they also say, and I quote, many policies continue to discourage non-retail uses within centres unfairly, despite our research finding that it is these uses that are lifting levels of activity in high streets. Given the emphasis on mixed-use town centres in the Town Centre Action Plan, what can the Scottish Government do to ensure that town centres thrive once again not just as a place to shop, but as a place to live, learn, visit and invest. Kevin, uh, sorry, Minister. Thank you, Senior Officer. I think the member makes a very good point that you want a variety of uses in town centres, not only retail. I think that was the point to which she was alluding. I will undertake to look specifically at the report to which she referred. I think it's a, a useful and a constructive suggestion that she's made. I did allude to the fact that uh, <clears throat> there are now powers being created for local authorities to establish a town centre investment zone and using discretionary rates relief. So that is one tool. And perhaps I could just add, I think it's relevant <clears throat> that uh, under our reforms of empty property relief, the Fresh Start Relief Scheme offers a 50% rates discount for the first year of occupation of certain long-term empty premises. And that has been done, presiding officer, precisely to provide an incentive to bring back empty premises back into use and to encourage diversification of town centres. Thank you, Mike McKenzie. Thank you. Um, does the Minister agree with me that sometimes the significance of the small business bonus scheme is, is understated and not properly appreciated and that we've seen a year-on-year -year increase in the number of businesses taking up the discounts available with 99,000 properties Could I across along, Scotland please? now benefiting from the scheme? Thank you, Minister. Uh, well, I agree that uh, understatement uh, of the benefits of the Small Business Bonus Scheme is a mistake that has been made. Not by me, however. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I have always emphasised that uh, small businesses deserved a better deal in Scotland. And when we became the administration in 2007, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance delivered that better deal. And ever since then, the number of small businesses benefiting has risen inexorably to the extent that now it is nearly 100,000, and that is providing a lifeline for many businesses, including in my constituency in Inverness, in places like the uh, Victorian market, where without the benefit 
of that reduction or elimination of business rates, I suspect many of them would not have been able to continue in business. So our pledge is to continue the scheme, uh, and I'm very grateful to Mr McKenzie for his campaigning on this issue, as always. Thank you. Question number four, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Office for National Statistics regarding the implications of the European System of Accounts 2010. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President, officer, Scottish Government officials have been working closely with the Office for National Statistics on the implications that the introduction of the European System of Accounts 2010 will have on a wide range of issues across the public sector. Thank you, Malcolm Chisholm. For that answer. So has, um, th have the discussions led him to believe that uh, it will be possible to unlock the delayed uh, capital uh, investment uh, which, without uh, a massive hit on upfront capital expenditure? And also in relation to uh, university funding, about which there is also considerable concern, have his officials had discussions about that? I believe University Scotland have had so, and of course they've uh, come to conclusions quite different from his own. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, the, uh, the work in relation to the classification of NPD and hub projects uh, is underway. We are still involved in discussions with the Office for National Statistics on this point, and we await uh, decisions made by the ONS. And of course, I'll advise Parliament, uh, as I have promised to do so, uh, when, I'm, uh, when I have that information to hand. And uh, I can assure Mr Chisholm and Parliament that a tremendous amount of effort is going in to resolve these issues because uh, I certainly want to make sure that these uh, construction projects are able to take their course. They are essential to the strengthening of the Scottish economy, as has been demonstrated by the economic data. On the issue in relation to the, um, the classification of universities, um, the Scottish Government is very clear that universities are autonomous bodies. Uh, we uh, do not believe there is anything in the bill that we put forward that contravenes the ONS indicators of control um, and uh, the government of course has set out those opinions and those views uh, very clearly to Parliament uh, in the course of recent debates. Thank you. John Scott. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister will be well aware of the concerns of South Ayrshire Council and other local authorities about delays caused to school building programmes and in my constituency this affects Air Academy and Queen Margaret Academy. Can he tell me in Parliament when these matters will be resolved and how he intends to resolve this problem with ONS in order to allow concerned local authorities such as South Ayrshire Council to proceed with their planned school rebuilding projects? John Sweeney. The first thing I'd say is, of course, there has been a very significant amount of school rebuilding and re refurbishing that has been undertaken by the government to date. And we are working our way through the... Uh, the conditions report on schools to ensure that we have a school estate that is appropriate for the 21st century. Uh, so a great deal has been achieved in this respect already. In relation to the forward programme and the issues that we face and that are the subject of this question, uh, the government, and I would assure Mr Scott on this point, the government is working uh, with all energy to resolve the issues that the Office for National Statistics have raised. Um, the, uh, Europe, the, the ESA rules have changed since we commenced our programme and as a consequence we are exploring and examining uh, the best way to respond to that. Uh, we have made proposals to the o Office for National Statistics and we await the outcome of their deliberations on those points. And finally I can assure Mr Scott that this issue will be resolved as quickly as it possibly can be and once resolved uh, I will take action to um, take forward the programme in the most appropriate way uh, in the environment of the decisions taken by the ONS. Question number five, Marto Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how much it has collected in land and buildings transaction tax. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, land and buildings transaction tax monthly statistics published by Revenue Scotland show that £183 million was raised from the tax in the first six months of operation. Thank you, Marta Fraser. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? Is that figure uh, in line with higher or lower than the sums expected to be raised by the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the, the caveat I would put on the, the figures that uh, I've shared with uh, Mr Fraser is that, of course, there, was the, there is an unresolved issue in relation to the first six months of the financial year, given the effects of forestalling because of the interaction between the uh, tax that we raise and what was uh, and the uh, predecessor tax uh, put in place by the United Kingdom government, and those issues become subject of the uh, the UK dis discussions with the UK government. 
We estimated that land and buildings transaction tax would raise £381 million in the course of this entire financial year. Um, the, estimate, the tax raised to date, uh, in my view, is in line with those estimations and uh, we will continue to monitor this for the remainder of the financial year. A brief supplementary, a brief answer, please, Jim Eady. Is the Cabinet Secretary able to confirm whether the land and building transaction tax in relation to the sale of properties below 330,000 will show that the doom-mongering of the Conservatives is completely and utterly without foundation. Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. Uh, well, President Officer, the, the figures published last week by Registers of Scotland show that house sales in the most recent quarter reached the highest volume for any quarter yeah. since April to June 2008, yeah, which yeah. is very encouraging indeed. And a number of commentators have recognised the positive effect which LBTT is having on the Scottish housing market, uh, Christine Campbell, the Managing Director for Scotland at Your Move, recently stated that LBTT has given the middle and lower tiers of the market a new lease of life. The, rapid, the recent rapid growth in Scotland is grounded in the new LBTT rates, which are stimulating demand at the bottom and the middle rungs of the property ladder, which is exactly what I intended to do as a consequence of the rates that I sent. Question number six, Hugh Henry. To ask the Scottish Government whether Renfrewshire Council or any local authority that decides to reduce its business rates would have to pay an equivalent amount to the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary. Any reduction by a Council of non-domestic rates in its area under Part 11 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 would be fully funded by that Council and its reported rates receipts would not be affected. Hugh Henry. President Officer, I think the Cabinet Secretary just avoided giving an answer. Um, because my understanding, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it will be funded by the councils, but they will have to pay the Scottish Government for the amount by which they reduce business rates. Can he confirm that that is the case? And if it is, does he think it's acceptable that council services such as education and home care uh, will have to be reduced in order to make sure that the Scottish Government doesn't lose a penny? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised by um, Mr Henry's response to what I thought was a very clear answer. I indicated that the reduction by a council of non-domestic rates in its area would be fully funded by that council and its reported rates receipts would not be affected. So that's the, that's the, um, the answer that I gave Mr Henry, which clearly addresses the question that he raised with me. I'd simply point out to Mr Henry that this is a power that local authorities welcomed being granted. Um, there was a very warm welcome uh, given to it by the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities and I think that represents the view of local authorities that want to exercise control to make their areas more attractive for investment and I would encourage local authorities to take up the opportunity the Government has created. Thank you. Question number seven, James Kelly. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action has been taken to protect jobs at the L and Clyde Bridge steel plants. Minister Fergus Ewing. Presiding officer, I and I am sure all members are concerned about the impact that the proposed mothballing of Tata Steel's operations at Clybridge and DL would have on the workforce, their families, the local communities and the steel industry in Scotland. Immediately the announcement was made, the First Minister convened a uh, multi-agency task force of which Mr Kelly is himself a member. I chaired the first meeting on the 29th of October. We meet again on 13th November, given the urgency of the action needed to find an alternative operator for Tata Steel's plants at DL and Clyde Bridge. The primary purpose of the task force is to find an alternative operator and the Scottish Government is determined to help secure a viable future for both plants. Thank you, James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Last week, the Minister told Parliament that Transport Scotland were undertaking work to identify uh, public infrastructure projects which would be relevant to Clyde Bridge and DL. Uh, that stream of work is absolutely urgent in terms of helping secure the future of the plant. Can I ask the Minister uh, what projects Transport Scotland have identified that would be relevant and also if any other public agencies have identified projects which would be relevant to uh, work carried out at Clyde Bridge and DL? Minister. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I can confirm that uh, Transport Scotland are carrying out a review for the purpose of ascertaining what more can be done. Um, I think it's important to point out that uh, Tata produces rails at Hainage Works in the northeast of France and that it would not be possible for Clybridge or DL to provide the steel for railway 
tracks. Uh, however, there are possibilities in the area of shipbuilding, and on October, uh, we awarded two contracts to uh, Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited. That is a possibility, although not in the immediate future. Just yesterday, presiding officer, I made a personal private visit uh, to DL and had a long discussion with both management and the trades union and workforce. And in the course of that, a, a useful suggestion was made that steel in bridges for road, road uh, projects could be the subject of steel uh, rolled at DL and quenched and tempered at uh, Clyde Bridge. That is being pursued. Michelle Rennie of Transport Scotland is to visit Tata to have the same discussion and to take with her experts in the procurement of that particular aspect of roadworks. All other potential aspects are, of course, being pursued by Transport Scotland and a full report will be made to the task force a week tomorrow. Thank you. A brief supplementary, Claire Adamson. Officer, does the Cabinet Secretary share my disappointment that the Scottish Government are being excluded from the EU talks to discuss the industry's future? Minister. I, well, I did write to Sajid Javid on the 2nd of November expressing my disappointment, Presiding Officer, at not having been given the opportunity to participate in a crucial EU level meeting. And I say that simply because you know, I do feel we have a strong case to make, informed by the benefit of a full parliamentary statement and input from across the chamber where there was uh, unanimous support and with a reasonable amount of knowledge garnered from the benefit of speaking to the management, the trades union and individually to the workforce. Uh, however, I don't want to dwell on that uh, in a political sense. Uh, I am pleased that an emergency competitive council to discuss the situation will be held on Monday the 9th of November and I've asked that our director for economic development is included as a member of the UK delegation and I hope that that request will be acceded to. Many thanks. Question number eight, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what additional powers over tax it considers should be devolved. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. The Scottish Government believes, President Officer, that the Scottish Parliament should have full control over all taxes raised in Scotland. As we set out in more powers for the Scottish Parliament in October 2014, and beyond Smith, more powers to the Scottish Parliament in June 2015, full fiscal autonomy remains our preferred package of powers short of independence. Thank you. Dave Thompson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, answer. And does he agree with me that the recent debate on tax credits in Westminster uh, gives a sense of urgency to devolution of those powers to this Parliament so that we can deal with the matter in a humane and sensible way? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President officer, the, the arguments about ensuring that we can exercise uh, the full financial responsibilities are important because they enable us um, yes, to ameliorate the challenges that are faced by vulnerable people as a consequence of welfare reforms in the United Kingdom, but they would also give us the ability and the capacity to grow and to strengthen the Scottish economy, which remains for me one of the uh, considerable weaknesses of the Smith Commission proposals of not giving us sufficient powers to grow and expand the Scottish economy. So uh, that balance of, uh, of powers is required to enable us to adequately and fully address the needs of the people of Scotland. Thank you. Question number nine, George Adam. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the rollout of superfast broadband. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President officer, the Scottish Government's Digital Scotland Supervised Broadband Programme is investing over £410 million of private and public sector funds to extend the coverage of fibre broadband to 95% of Scottish premises by the end of 2017, with an interim milestone of 85% coverage by March 2016. Uh, the prog programme is progressing through two regional projects, one led by HIE and another led by the Scottish Government. The Digital Scotland Supervised Broadband Programme is a key step in the Scottish Government's aim for Scotland to become a world-class digital nation by 2020. We are less than halfway through the physical rollout. However, we are already more than halfway towards our 2017 target of 750,000 homes and businesses, with over 460,000 premises now having access. This is the fastest deployed network in the United Kingdom, and we are enabling an average of 7,000 homes and businesses each week across Scotland. Without this intervention programme, only 66% of Scotland's homes and businesses would have access to fibre broadband services. We have also set up Community Broadband Scotland to work with those communities unlikely to have superfast coverage delivered through the DSSB programme and support them design and implement sustainable broadband solutions. George Adam. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed answer. And a number of my constituents have contacted regarding exchange-only lines. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how Digital Scotland, along with its partners, are working to deal with the issues of exchange-only lines? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President, a number of homes and businesses throughout Scotland are connected directly to the local exchange via an exchange-only line. These lines present a greater engineering challenge to address than those connected via roadside cabinets. However, the good news is that there are a number of solutions available under the Scottish Government's Digital Scotland programme. These technical solutions are often complex and time-consuming and significantly more expensive than standard solutions. However, the programme will always look to deploy the solution best suited to each situation while maintaining our value for money criteria. Digital Scotland has already enabled over 80,000 exchange-only homes and businesses across Scotland, and that number is increasing every week. I have a number of supplementaries. I'll try and take them if the questions and answers are brief. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary will be familiar with the Super, uh, connect, the super Connected Cities uh, broadband voucher scheme, which the UK Government closed six months early uh, the other week, as a result, no doubt, of high demand from small and medium-sized enterprises in our uh, major cities. I wonder what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government about the reopening or replacement of that scheme in due course. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there are uh, a number of developments in the Superfast Broadband Programme that are currently under consideration. Um, the, uh, the, the Government, as I have reported to Parliament, we have a gain share element of the contract which is enabling us to extend the rollout. Um, within the existing contract and uh, we will continue uh, to explore every opportunity to try to support the, uh, the rollout of supervised broadband. It is particularly important that businesses become engaged in this process because it is a strong platform for competitiveness in the years to come. Liam MacArthur. Very much. The Cabinet Secretary has referred to the programme being taken forward with Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and I very much uh, welcome that. He will be aware that the target uh, of coverage across the region is around 84 per cent, uh, but he, he may also be aware that in places like Orkney, the coverage is likely to fall short of that, around 75 per cent. Does he believe that it should be a priority both for Community Broadband Scotland and any additional in investment to bring those areas such as Orkney, who fall below the regional average, up to that regional average and beyond? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I recognise the importance of this issue to uh, the constituents that Mr MacArthur represents. And, um, I, I, would, I would want, although I have set out that our target is to get to 95 per cent of Scottish premises by the end of 2017, that is in the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme. The remaining 5 per cent remain very much in my sight as to how we can find solutions for those individuals and premises. Community Broadband Scotland has a particular role to perform in, in working with communities to identify the most appropriate solutions. And I know that uh, many projects are already in scope with Community Broadband Scotland to enable that to happen. So I would want to assure Mr MacArthur and his constituents that uh, finding solutions to the challenges for people out with the core programme that we are rolling out remain uppermost in the minds of the Scottish Government and in the design of the programme and we will uh, in ensure that um, every opportunity is taken to try to ensure those services are delivered as speedily as possible to some of the constituents who you cannot currently see where that service will be coming from. Apologies to the other members who wanted in but I'm afraid I need to move on. Question number 10, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support the PACE team can provide to unemployed professional footballers who have been re released by their club. Minister Ferguson. Uh, PACE stands for Partnership Action for Continuing Employment. It is the Scottish Government's initiative dedicated to helping individuals and employers with the advice and support they need when faced with redundancy. This support is also available to individuals whose contracts have not been renewed and pay support is therefore available to unemployed professional footballers who have been released by their club. PACE offers free and impartial advice and support that is tailored to meet individual needs and local circumstances. It includes one-to-one -one counselling, information on rights and entitlements, benefits and entitlements and tax calculation, help with job search, CV writing, application forms and covering letters, preparation for interviews, identifying learning and training opportunities, starting up a business, and making the most of your money and coping with redundancy-related stress. Mark Griffin. Thank the Minister for that answer. Hundreds of young footballers per year are signed by clubs on pro-youth contracts, and it suggested that up to 95% of those young players fail to make the grade and are released. Um, can the Minister tell me what arrangements the Scottish Government 
has with the SFA or the SPFL to support young people who find themselves unemployed and may not have considered an alternative career. And would he ask the PACE team to investigate the, the situation and offer support to retrain and seek alternative employment? Minister. Well, I, I think Mr Griffin has raised a serious and relevant issue, and uh, uh, I can assure him, of course, as I think he will well know, that both football clubs and authorities take very seriously their responsibility to all their employees, with particular regard to the fact that many of them may leave their employment at an early age, an issue that he has raised in this chamber uh, today. So I, I can assure the member that because he's asked this and raised this in, in the chamber today, I will specifically ask PACE to seek uh, to engage uh, both with the SPFL and the SFA specifically to check out that uh, there is nothing more that can be done. And indeed, if there is more that can be done, uh, then I'm sure PACE will be ready to do it. Question number 11, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out on the possible impact on its finances of English votes for English laws. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is concerned that the evil procedures will exclude Scottish MPs from key decisions on bills that will affect Scottish finances through the Barnett formula. Following evidence from the Scottish Government, the Westminster Procedures Committee has highlighted Barnett consequentials as an issue to be examined in reviewing the operation of the standing orders. Now that the Commons has adopted evil procedures, uh, effective intergovernmental cooperation on all West Westminster bills is even more crucial. Bill Kidd. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Um, many of my constituents uh, share worries that uh, the cuts by the Westminster Government to those <coughs> areas of responsibility uh, using evil will reflect on the Barnet consequentials coming to the Scottish Government. Can he tell me if there are um, any debates or any uh, discussions uh, arranged in order to address this issue? Thank Cabinet you. Secretary. This is an issue that will be pers pursued through the intergovernmental machinery that exists. Uh, I think many of these issues would be better protected if we had greater provision within the Scotland Bill on the entrenchment of the procedures of the Sewell Convention, which is the proper statutory approach for consideration of the um, the, the, the questions in relation to uh, the, this subject. Uh, but I can assure Mr Kidd that this issue will be um, assiduously monitored by the Scottish Government as we determine the implications of this significant change to parliamentary procedures. Thank you. Question number 12, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, when the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy last met the Chancellor of the Exchequer and what issues were discussed? Cabinet Secretary. I last, I last met the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the 8th of June 2015. We discussed matters in relation to the fiscal framework and the economy. I have also met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on four occasions since June to progress negotiations on the fiscal framework for Scotland. Thank you, Bob Doris. If that answer can ask the Cabinet Secretary to draw to the UK Chancellor's attention the 250,000 working families in Scotland that are due to lose at least £1,500 a year due to tax credit cuts, something that is particularly relevant to my constituents given that 60 per cent of Glasgow kids stay in households that rely on tax credits. And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to redouble his efforts and urge the UK Government to uh, scrap this pernicious attack on the working poor that I represent in the City of Glasgow and across Scotland? John Swinney. Um, President Officer, uh, I, th I think the, the Chancellor will be well aware of the difficulties created by his tax uh, credit proposals. Um, given the decisions of the House of Lords just last week. And, of course, we await the outcome of the spending review at the end of the month to determine what will be the final form of the proposals that uh, are taken forward uh, and the response of the United Kingdom Government. I uh, agree with Mr Doris about the um, pernicious effects of these changes. These uh, changes will cause real hardship uh, to some people working very hard to get on in life. And... Um, it is uh, certainly I associate the government with his remarks about the need to ensure that changes of this nature uh, are not progressed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Okay, question number 13, John Wilson. Reading officer, to ask the Scottish Government what meetings it has had with the UK Government regarding devolution of onshore coal and gas extraction licensing. Minister Fergusson. All coal extraction licensing, including that for underground coal gasification, is the responsibility of the UK Coal Authority and therefore a reserved matter. The devolution of coal licensing has not been discussed with the UK Government at this time. If the, member is if the member is referring to conventional onshore gas extraction, I can confirm 
that the licensing process for all onshore gas extraction is due to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament in line with the recommendations from the Smith Commission. The Scottish Government continues to engage with the UK Government about the plans for devolution and the Scotland Bill 215, but there have been no recent discussions about this specific matter. John Milson. I thank the Minister for his response. As the Minister will be aware, I have submitted a number of written questions to the Scottish Government relating to this issue. It has been an issue I and a large part of the Scottish public are very concerned about. Will the Minister tell us what consultation the Scottish Government plans to have with local authorities, community groups, regarding the transfer of the licensing powers in terms of gas extraction and when these powers are expected to be transferred to the Scottish Government? Minister. Well, I, I can certainly confirm that the member has uh, raised this matter in, on a number of occasions. I recognise that. Uh, and we engage regularly with local authority about the discharge of all our responsibilities insofar as it affects their local interests. And this will be no exception this particular interest. And I can advise uh, the member that I shall be meeting with Stephen Hagan, the economic uh, development spokesperson of COSLA in the near future. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I uh, will certainly be raising these matters with the uh, local authorities. And of course, we do need to do so preparatory to the transfer of these powers uh, whenever that comes. And I'm not sure that a precise date has yet been settled by the Westminster Parliament, but hopefully that will be the case soon. A brief supplementary and a brief answer, please, Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Just a quick question to the Minister to ask how he will ensure that the research that uh, comes under the remit of the Scottish Government's moratorium will apply to existing projects that are currently um, under licence or under planning. Minister. Uh, well, the process of uh, research that we set out, this extremely comprehensive uh, programme presiding officer in uh, relation to unconventionals and therefore that research uh, will cover uh, all aspects uh, of uh, the uh, issues in relation to such matters as the prospective possible impact on the environment, the impact on transport, the impacts for traffic as well as the economic issues uh, there and end. Uh, there have been no uh, planning applications so far as I'm aware for hydraulic fracturing so in that respect, I do not think there are any current uh, applications or matters in where the research would need to consider the position in Scotland, and certainly there have been none granted. So in that respect, it's difficult to quite see how that research can encompass uh, developments which have not yet taken place. But if I've in any way misunderstood the question that the member has asked, or if there are any other matters that she has, please do not hesitate to write to me, and I will endeavour to reply as quickly Thank as possible. Thank you, Minister. Question number 14, Chick Brodie. To ask the Scottish Government what plans the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has to provide financial support for the creation of more businesses in the social enterprise sector in the south of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. Presiding officer, Scotland is regarded as world leading in the support that it provides to social enterprise. The Scottish Government is committed to supporting and investing in the sector as part of the development of a capable, sustainable and enterprising third sector. The Scottish Government has maintained funding of £24.5 million to the third sector in 2015-16 and the detail of our forthcoming spending plans will be set out in the Scottish Budget. The social enterprises in Scotland, a social enterprise in Scotland is thriving with 5,200 companies now, a 42% increase in the last 10 years and a net worth of over £3 billion. And the Cabinet Secretary has been congratulated on his very personal commitment to the sector's success. Will the Scottish Government expand its commitment to social enterprises by asking local authorities in the south of Scotland to further engage with social enterprises to outsource to these enterprises and have them provide non-core local services and activities in so secure community involvement? Cabinet Secretary. I, I agree very much with uh, Mr Brodie's suggestion. Uh, I think there is an opportunity for us to redesign public services uh, to involve social enterprises in a fashion <laughs> that makes a real impact on the lives of individuals within Scotland, particularly in some of the isolated locations in the south of Scotland that will be represented by Mr Brodie. So I think I would encourage all public authorities to engage constructively with, uh, third, with social enterprises to find ways in which this sector can make a more profound contribution to our economy and to the delivery of our public services. Thank you. Question 15, Nanette Milne. You, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy has made of the future funding formula for NHS boards. Cabinet Secretary. 
Presiding officer, the NRAC formula is used to inform funding for NHS boards and is calculated independently. While NRAC shares are regularly subject to revision and refinement, there are no current plans to change the use of this formula in the future. We remain committed to moving all boards to being no greater than 1% below NRAC parity, and this is reflected in the £420 million invested by the Scottish Government in parity funding since 2012-13. Very briefly, please, Nanette Mill. Thank the Minister for that answer. Given the fact that NHS Grampian has been underfunded per head of population in all but one year of this Parliament, what assurance can he give that the Health Board won't fall behind again in the foreseeable future? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has uh, taken action, as I explained in my earlier answer, to address the issues where uh, boards uh, are more than 1% below NRAC parity. Uh, that will remain our position in uh, forthcoming years. Uh, Grampian, of course, has um, had a total of £29 million allocated to it in 2015-16, specifically to accelerate movement to NRAC parity. Um, and the government will, of course, consider all of these issues as part of the budget process um, which follows the UK spending review. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the question time. And the next item of business is the debate on motion number 14688 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's children.